Good afternoon. On behalf of the Fondation Meyer, the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique and its President, Antoine Petit, its Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences and its Director, François-Joseph Rougiou, I'm extremely honoured to offer to you the Jean Nico Reward, Lida Cosmides and John Tooby. As you nicely mentioned that you are chasing this reward for a long time, I'm also very happy to end this long quest that will allow you to enrich your already very abundant collection of awards. Leda, I could mention your 1988 American Association for the Advancement of Science Prize for Behavioral Science Research, the 1993 American Psychological Association Distinguished Scientific Award for an Early Career Contribution to Psychology, a Guggenheim Fellowship and the 2005 National Institute of Health Directors Pioneer Award. I could also mention the Human Behavior and Evolution Society for both your careers in 2013. I know that the Adapted Mind, Evolutionary Psychology and the Generation of Culture, published in 1992, is the bedside book of every member of the Institute jean -Nico, along with later common works, Universal Mind, Explaining the New Science of Evolutionary Psychology, and Evolutionary Psychology Foundational Papers, both published in 2000. The CNRS, as a research organism, pays the utmost attention to scientific visions as yours that intend to go beyond outdated dualisms, and more generally speaking, beyond the various obstacles, be it institutional, epistemological or social, that prevent the dialogue between sciences. As scientists, you both embody the ambition for such a dialogue, especially with the foundation of the UCSP Center for Evolutionary Psychology. This ambition is also the core meaning of evolutionary psychology itself, defined, as you proposed, as a way to think about human mind in every respect, rather than as a specific approach of the mind or a perspective allowing to deal with specific aspects of the mind's life. Evolutionary psychology has its roots in biology, but as such, it also has fundamental implications for anthropology as well as for cognitive sciences. What is mostly interesting and enlightening to me is the weaving dimension, and I could say weaving style of thinking you propose. The needle being evolutionary psychology you propose to sew various species together, that is cognitive science, human evolution, hunter-gatherer studies, neuroscience, psychology, evolutionary biology, and behavioral studies, in an attempt to understand and map the human mind and brain. As a member of the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, in charge of the relationship with the Institute for Biological Sciences, I can only be responsive to your argument according to which the human brain is a computational system produced by evolution and human nature a collection of reliably developing species typical information processing adaptations. I can only be sensitive to your approach that embraces the human mind as such but also one mind in relationship with other minds, social life and its institutions. As a member of the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, I may only wish that your fierce criticism of social sciences will entail a debate with the latter, and more than a debate, the emergence of a common wish for an integrated vision of human mind and human social life. So please, come to Paris to give the NICO lecture series as early as possible. You will find opponents, but also allies, to defend the approach you dedicated a life of empirical and theoretical work to. I thank you very much. Hi, I'm Lita Cosmides and this is John Tooby. And we're here to thank you so much for choosing us for the jean Nicot Prize. Um, we're, we were shocked. Um, we were extremely happy and very honored because if I could choose any award of it in, in all of the psychological sciences, 
um, this is the award I would want to get. Um, I've been tracking this one since 1993, since you gave it first to Jerry Fodor, and it has, you've given it to some of my very favorite um, cognitive scientists and philosophers of mine, and it's just amazing um, that you chose us. Um, uh, we wanted to thank all of you, the CNRS, the École Normale Supérieure, uh, the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences, and uh, the Meyer Foundation for Cultural and Artistic Development. John? And uh, uh, I just wanted to uh, emphasize that uh, how delighted, uh, how honored we are and grateful and how delighted we're going to be to come and get to talk to you because uh, as I say, it's, it's, uh, we're really looking forward to being able to address so many interesting people uh, and uh, uh, learn whatever you get out of it, we will learn a part of it. Um, anyway, so uh, once again, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you whenever the fates permit. As John said, we're, we're looking forward to coming to Paris um, and uh, to give the Jean-Nicole lecture series. And the title for our series is gonna be The Adaptationist Revolution and the Transformation of the Cognitive Sciences. Um, uh, we'll switch off on the four lectures. And in the first one, I'm gonna give a general overview of what an evolutionary approach to psychology looks like. Um, it's the evolutionary psychology is not a particular branch of psychology. It's a way of thinking about, about the mind and it can be applied to any topic uh, that you want um, from spatial cognition to social reasoning to the emotions and motivation. Um, so I want to, it has a lot of moving parts. And so since many of you may not be as uh, familiar with it, I wanna give you the broad overview first of what this way of thinking entails. Um, then uh, the second, in the second lecture that I give, um, I wanna talk about adaptationism as a source of normative theories of rationality. Um, there's a long tradition in cognitive psychology of comparing human cognition um, to normative theories of rationality from mathematics, logic, economics, philosophy. And usually the comparison is unfavorable. Usually people come to the conclusion that we're, we're poor at thinking about probability theory, we're poor at logical reasoning, um, we violate tenets of economic rationality, we do terrible moral reasoning, and so on. But I wanna ask, well, what justifies these normative theories, the ones that are usually used as a proper standard for assessing the rationality of an evolved computational system. The choice of a normative theory is really important because it can obscure the operation of, sophisticated, of a sophisticated cognitive system or with the right normative theory, it can reveal it. Um, so the adaptation as program in evolutionary biology, I wanna argue that it provides a meta normative theory of rationality that's much more appropriate for evolved organisms. The functional design of our cognitive architecture was built by natural selection. It was built to solve information processing problems that are very strange, exact, and many of which are non-intuitive. Theories of adaptive function, task analyses of these problems, or what David Marr would have called uh, theories of the computation, provide normative standards of good design for assessing the rationality of human cognition. So what I hope to do with a number of case studies and specific examples, I hope to show how this approach can reveal sophisticated computational machinery that would otherwise remain completely undetected. And at the same time, I hope that with these cases, I can illustrate some of the pitfalls of studying reasoning and choice without reference to the ancestral problems and the ancestral environments that selected for their design. I'm gonna now turn it over to John. Our addiction, our heroin, is starting with fundamental questions and building more or less deductively 
all the way to detailed theories of specific phenomena. I don't want to overemphasize the deductive leap because, uh, of course, uh, reality is extremely complicated and many things beyond one's models uh, affect things. But anyway, in my two lectures, I'm going to summon the local ghost of Rene Descartes in the sense of starting at the simplest of beginnings, going step by self-evident step, building from simple to complex, eventually to show that many such steps can take us to new and I hope surprisingly interesting places. The starting questions are, what is order? Where does it ultimately come from? We have in the sciences a tension between, or contradiction between the idea of order used in physics as an objective reality that determines outcomes, for example, in thermodynamics, and its use in information theory and elsewhere where particular kinds of order can be seen to exist or not relative to specified frames of reference which can be chosen or constructed at will. Shannon's information theory, for example, depends upon a pre-specified coordinated but arbitrary set of messages existing in both sender and receiver, like the alphabet. In reconciling this tension between objective and relative order, I'll start from physical first principles involving entropy and its natural adversary or natural prey, the order found in self-replicating physical systems, that is in life forms. Entropy is the most savage single selection pressure and it preys on life's indispensable organization ceaselessly. From set theory and replicators, you naturally get the theory of natural selection and combined with the operation of physics, it allows you to recognize a new kind of physical order, replicative functional order, which is an order that is physically objective, but distinct from other known kinds of physical order. Indeed, biological systems evolve to dom domesticate otherwise deadly entropy by creating specialized domains or frames of reference in which specific kinds of increasing uh, physical or chemical entropy or disorder, for example, gas diffusion, increases replicative order, that is oxygen delivery to cells. Natural selection constructs adaptations or devices that manifest replicative functional order. That is, they execute what may be called replicative work for the organism. The various sub-theories of natural selection, such as kin selection, theories of cooperation and communication, the theory of animal conflict, specify kind, specific kinds of replicative work, which can be used to discover previously unknown circuit logics in the architectures of organisms and lead us to understand why they have the designs that they do. We'll illustrate this throughout with various case studies from our work. Each kind of replicative problem specifies a distinct objective frame of reference that assigns a biological meaning to the objects it's designed to operate on. From this, we get a specific species-specific objective foundation for what might be called systems of biological meaning and their associated frames of reference. Psychology and cognitive science deal with the engineering specifications of the cybernetic control systems for animals that give us an information theory appropriate to, for organisms. Thus, we have a principled foundation for psychology and cognitive science that connects it seamlessly to the rest of the natural sciences. In particular, the cognitive revolution can be extended to the study of motivation and emotion and the meaning systems that evolve, involve them. We can give a sort of first principles explanation of what um, emotion is, for example. Hume famously pointed out that you can't logically derive an ought from it is. His argument generalizes from morality to motivation. It's the same argument in essence. No set of facts by itself gives an organism any disposition or guidance in how to act. Hence, the fundamental nuclei of our motivational evaluation systems must be given by natural selection. And you need as many different, I'm gonna say incommensurate of all motivational systems as there are adaptive problems where the biological definition of success differs from the other definitions of success. So in nutrition and feeding, it's different than sex, it's different than status, it's different than reciprocity, it's different than incest avoidance, mutual conditional insurance, uh, parenting, attentional direction, the effort of paying attention, what to pay attention to, fear, aggressive potentiation, group navigation, play, and on and on. There's lots of different motivational systems and that pulls something along with it. 
you cannot have valuation towards a target or object without some of all conceptual machinery, what we would once have called the eight ideas, and we now might say informally is evolved mental content to cross connect of all systems of biological meaning to the contingent things they correspond to in an individual organism's world. Right? If you're going to love your mother, if the species has evolved machinery to deal with mothers, for example, the brain needs a system to cross connect that machinery in a particular mind to a particular individual woman in that person's specific life, right? So there's this mapping uh, uh, set of machinery involved. Um, finally, taking tools and findings from ev the evolutionary psychology of end party cooperation, the theory of animal conflict and so on, together can be used to form uh, the cognitive motivational foundations of evolved political psychology with all its strange and troubling ramifications. We very much look forward to coming to Paris and talking and listening to you about these and many other topics. And once again, mm -hmm. we're really, really, really happy. And thank you so much. And again, uh, happy